For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Catch for the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Carlo Anderson and Steve Bakken on Super Talk 1270, Saturday afternoons 1 till 4 on Super Talk 1270. Portions of the following program are pre recorded. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bakken and uh, Patience joining us in the studio today from Western North Dakota Honor Flight. Uh, uh, boy, what a, what, what a great organization. And, and I was so. I, I, you have no idea how thankful I am that I was on that flight uh, this fall. Um, amazing experience. Amazing experience. And, and I've been to most of the. Uh, most of the monuments in Washington, D.C. patients. But going with the veterans, it, it, it puts it in an entirely new light. So thanks for coming in today because you guys have some great events coming up as well. We do. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, that experience of, uh, you know, I'd been to all the monuments before, but going with the Western North Dakota Honor Flight and the veterans, is it's its own experience. You can't it even explain it, it. It's just, it's humbling is the only way I can yeah. describe it, but it puts it in an entirely different perspective. Yeah, experiencing it with the people who those memorials were built for. Right, and, and went through the experience that yeah. know the story behind yeah. those memorials and, and getting to talk to those veterans too and go, okay, what, I mean... You sit there and, and, and just hug a guy for 10 minutes who, who's breaking down because yeah. all of his buddies, he lost them all. Or, yeah. you know, it's just humbling, absolutely just, humbling. Just walking that journey with them and even just being an observer rather than a participant is its own experience. And I, I just can't say enough for Western North Dakota Honor Flight. And like for me as a veteran, experiencing that with older veterans, you know, from World War II and Korea and Vietnam is... Um, an experience you cannot explain until you've had it. You know, my trip, because uh, I was supposed to go in the spring and then I got pushed back to the fall because my father-in-law, right. um, Wendy's dad was going on that and he was a veteran. He went with his buddy. So I had another little layer on top of that as well. But right. at, on that flight, I ran into so many people from the Bismarck Mandan area that I knew and I didn't know their story. And, right. and then you get talking to them because they open up a little bit on the yeah, honor they, flight. They don't share that story no, otherwise. They don't. And I have all those good relationships I had are on a different level now because the people that I went on that trip with that opened up a little bit about their story. Yeah. It's just, again, just an incredibly humbling experience. And anything we can do to help get those veterans connected to the honor flight and to right. the monuments and it's to just the experience. It's, it's a healing process. It, it just absolutely truly is. is. Um, so give us a little backstory on, on Western North Dakota honor flight before we get into some of the events. Cause you got operation Christmas coming up and I want to talk about that because the deadline's coming up on uh, December 12th. Uh, little backstory for the Western North Dakota honor flight. So the Western North Dakota honor flight is one of several hundred hubs to the honor flight network. Honor flight network was created several years ago, um, by veterans, um, seeing a need to bring our world war II, Korea and Vietnam era veterans to, to see the memorials that were built in their honor. And it, it started with, you know, bringing one veteran, then bringing two veterans, and then these hubs um, popping up all over the United States. And Because we started off with uh, North Dakota Honor Flight over in the eastern part of the right. state. And yep. 
the demand was there. We have so many veterans. And in North Dakota, we're so blessed to have such a connection to service we with are. the military here in North Dakota yep. and, and the Guard. And and everybody continues that service through the Guard or the Reserves. And, and there was a need. Western North Dakota had a need. And... Uh, Western North Dakota Honor Flight grew into that. It did grow. It did grow into that, and and you pointed it out perfectly. You know, having these veterans travel to Fargo uh, from Western North Dakota, that became a challenge. Mm-hmm. And so the Western North Dakota Honor Flight grew out of that, and um, we serve um, from Jamestown West and Jamestown North to Canada, and Jamestown South to the South Dakota border, and. Um, getting those veterans connected to the honor flight is is a goal um and it's pretty easy to do you connect through our website um you can connect through our facebook page and right on our website is the the application form um if you aren't comfortable filling that out yourself uh get with a buddy get with a friend get with a, a grandchild get with you know someone who may be more comfortable doing that and they can walk you through that process it's really simple um, and we kind of have a, a motto. It's a first to apply, first to fly. Now, there are some caveats to that, but, you know, get your application in. Be, become part of this. It, it's a life-changing experience. I've talked to a lot of veterans that are like, I, I, do I qualify for this? I'm like, no, you do. And, yeah, that's And get that's on the a, list. I mean, that, that's, it's part of the messaging that, no, you served. You're entitled to this. Right. Please fill out the yeah, paperwork that's and get a, on the list. That's a misconception that you have to have served in the country of Vietnam or that you had to have served in Korea or have served in World War II. And that's not how it works. It, we refer to it as World War II era, Korean War era, era. Vietnam era. And, and you know, a, a lot of people, particularly guardsmen, national guardsmen, um, we'll say, well, I didn't, I, you know, I, I didn't really serve. Yes, you did. You served. Yeah. <laughs> you served. Apply. It's, you know, you, you served your country. Well, I, I talked to one veteran that didn't think they were eligible because they were stationed in Germany during Vietnam. I'm like, no, no you're, you're part of the support. You served. It, right. Yeah. Yep. You served in those years or that era and you are eligible and yeah, it's 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 an experience like no other, and really get those applications in. That's what we need. We need we need to continue to grow this program. And, and what's the website? Uh, WesternNDHF.org. dot org. It's pretty simple. Pretty simple, <laughs> and it's a simple form. And if you have any problems with it, somebody will help you fill out the form. Absolutely, and and you know you can get a paper form and fill it out and mail it into us. We'll take it that way. Um, our phone number is right on the website. Uh, you can give us a call. We can walk you through the application. Uh, one of the things you guys are doing, uh, and God bless you for stepping up two flights a year, which is logistically a little bit more difficult. A little bit more and difficult. Costs a little <laughs> bit more money, but um, that's where the fundraising comes in. Um, and we're going to talk about an event you got coming up in January, but uh, you've also got Operation Christmas going on right now. We do. So it's Operation Christmas Cheer. And what we're looking for, um, we want to send a Christmas card to every veteran who we've flown on the honor flight. Um, and it's a great uh, opportunity for service organizations, um, confirmation groups that have servant projects that they have to do. Um School Class groups, projects, yeah, school yeah. groups, absolutely. So, what the ask is? If you're a business, yeah, it, if you're you a know, business, take 15 minutes out uh, during a lunch break, and it's a yep. great team building operation. It, it's an excellent team building operation. Um, it it can be for service groups. It you know this is a the ask is um, that you uh, write Christmas cards. Um, it doesn't have to be a physical card. It can be a, a picture, a poster, something that you do, um, and put it in an envelope and send it to us. Don't seal the envelopes inside the big envelope. <laughs> um, that way we can we can add stuff to it. Um, and the goal is to send one to every veteran who's flown with us so far. Um, How many and, veterans have you flown so far? Um, I, I believe the number is 322. I, I would have to ballpark, look that up. Uh, yeah, yeah, ballpark, but I, I believe it's 322. So we've had three flights so far. Um, we have another one coming up, like you mentioned, in the spring, um, and our goal is two a year. And that's a that's a that's a 
That's a big chunk of money, but Operation it's worth Operation Christmas it. Cheer, uh, get a card written to uh, a veteran that's flown on the flight. Uh, uh, deadline December 12th. Deadline's December 12th. And what we're asking is, is since we're sending it to the veterans, that you just address it, uh, your message to a uh, dear veteran. Um, that way we can make sure it goes, is, has the ability to go to any of our veterans. If somebody wants more information on this, of course, the uh, Facebook page, great source. But uh, if a teacher for a class project, uh, they can go to the website, get all the information there or contact you guys as well. They can. And um, one of our board members, her name is Becky. She is the direct contact and her phone number. uh, She asked that we provide that phone number for people to get get in touch with her um, and this program is 701 Four hundred eight eight three five, and she can uh, walk you through Operation Christmas Cheer and how to get your cards uh, developed and sent in. Um, she'll have ideas for you if you're a, a service group, uh, an organization, a business. Um, she can help you with that. And then uh, AMVETS Dinner and Auction coming up January 17th. It is. That's an exciting uh, program that we've got going on. So, um, we really love doing the dinners and the auctions because you see so many of the former uh, honor flight veteran veterans, <laughs> and uh, they they come in and they're excited. They talk to other people who are there about the the flight and what they loved about it and how it was life changing for them. Um, and in addition, you get a great meal, and you have the opportunity to bid on um, several auction items. And the auction items um, are donated by businesses, so we are always looking for. So you're still items. looking for donation items or we sponsorships, are, or sponsorships, and and that information is available on our website as well. But this this uh, auction, we're going to have live music. Um, uh, one of our board members has a has a DJ service, and so he's providing that for us. Um, so it's going to be a fun, upbeat environment, and really looking forward to, to seeing a lot of the previous veterans on our flights and and a lot of new faces as well. Operation Christmas Cheer, deadline for writing those Christmas cards to the veterans that have been on the flight December 12th. Uh, January 17th, the AMVETS dinner and auction. Put that on your calendar. You can get all the details on the website. WesternNDHF.org. All right, perfect. Patient, thanks for coming in today. Absolutely. Uh, This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Grainger. Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Grainger.com, or just stop by. Grainger. For the ones who get it done. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bike along with Jason Spees joining us on the program. Catch Jason with the Crude Life each and every Sunday morning, 10 a.m., right here on Super Talk 1270. Uh, big day today, of course. Uh, some breaking news. Uh, we're going to talk with uh, Matt Fern in a little bit as well about uh, um, something going on with the Commerce Department. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Also, uh, uh, we're going to visit with Sarah Stogner, our unicorn lawyer, and get our NFL picks, our private public picks. Uh, and, of course, uh, Elliot Huggins, Dakota Resource Council. A lot going on with Summit Carbon Solutions uh, uh, pipeline, proposed CO2 pipeline. Elliot, thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks so much. And then, uh, Jason, of course, welcome, my friend. How you doing? Not too bad, Mr. Steve Bakken. Elliot, thank you very much. And uh, hello. Hello and greetings, salutations, and I am uh, very cold this morning. It's a cold <laughs> winter, it's free little... winter day. We, we're, we're a month away from winter, and I'm already tapping out, guys. Uh, at least out. you're not up to your butt in snow. This time last year, we were up to our butt in snow. And just wait. Uh, you know, and honestly, <laughs> it, well, you know, the one nice thing about Thanksgiving is that we are reminded back in the 90s, it snowed in Dallas because Leon Lett has one of the most historic <laughs> blunders in, in, in Thanksgiving history. But for all the climate change people out there, there is documentation on Thanksgiving that Leon Lett 
and the snow bowl on Thanksgiving. So it does snow down in Texas uh, and everything like that. And, you know, uh, I'm going to use that to transition into our guest, Steve, because uh, this morning we put out a story on Vivek Rams, Rams, uh, Swami, Ramaswamy, how Ramaswamy. Thank you. I always feel bad when I mispronounce his name and I have from the very beginning and I need to, uh, why change now? You know, you, you're on a roll. Why change now? <laughs> well, on, on Friday, he's going to be down in Iowa. And he's going to be uh, actually making this Carbon Summit Solutions Pipeline part of the presidential platform, Steve. Think about that. I saw that. That's where I saw we're that at too, yep. with this with this pipeline. Yeah, so uh, I assume that's why Elliot is uh, kind of in... And is to talk about the uh, carbon pipeline and some of the uh, landowner issues and et cetera. So um, that's my introduction. I don't know. I, I might have gotten a little bit ahead of the cart here. So. No, no, because that's a great promo. For, we're going to talk about that last. But uh, also we've got uh, some breaking news with the Public Service Commission. We got a date uh, for when their next hearing is going to be. Uh, also, Monday, there was an information meeting at the Bismarck Public Library. We're going to get the details on that because there was some video taken. Uh, so people had an opportunity to speak out. Also... Uh, uh, um, City of Bismarck is at their last commission meeting, now is going to be an intervener. We'll get the details on that. And uh, the latest on the Navigator and Wolf Pipeline, how that relates to Summit and what's going on in Iowa and Illinois as well. So a lot to cover. Elliot, thanks for coming in. Uh, yeah, Elliot Huggins, be here. Uh, Dakota Resource Council. So first and foremost, uh, let's talk about Monday. So Monday's a uh, little meeting at the Bismarck Public Library, well attended. A lot of people had an opportunity to get there and speak, and, and you guys were taking video testimony as well. Yeah, for sure, and it was a really good meeting, and I, I kind of went in this meeting, you know, planning the meeting, thinking of it more in terms of folks who have, you know, kind of already been engaged in this and giving them, you know, the tools of next steps moving forward, um, getting them engaged on, you know, some marketing and public awareness. Um, but was, to your point, really encouraging was there was a lot of new faces um, and new folks there, um, especially from um, the new um, proposed route through Burley County. So that was really, really encouraging. Um, I think you said Matt Fern's going to be on um, after me. Um, he had a great team over there um, taking video testimonials of landowners, um, concerned citizens that will be rolling out here, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, and to get some more awareness on the issue. So, yeah, really good meeting, really, really productive. Um, happy to always have new people um, in the fight, and yeah, it'll it'll be really good to see that content we get out in the next couple of weeks. You know, one of the things with uh, getting that message out a little bit more, because it, it, for some reason, I don't understand why, but um, either mainstream media or it's just been kind of slow getting the word out of what's going on in people's backyards through Burley and Emmons County was on board at first, and... Um, but now with that proposed change of the pipeline, it's almost like you have to get that message out again because, you know, people don't know what they don't know. And, and they may not know that it's going in their backyard now right. instead of somebody else's. Yeah, absolutely. And prior to this meeting, there were some pretty local meetings I know in uh, Glenview Township, um, Cromwell Township. Um, the the Board of Supervisors actually in Glenview Township remarked, this is the most people we've ever had a uh, Board of Supervisors meeting uh, ever. So that's really, really encouraging. Um, and I definitely don't think from all the conversations I've had, um, all these meetings with people, that people are just finding out about this um, with the new route, you know, a little further north of Bismarck. Uh, they're not they're not too happy about this either. And I don't I don't think getting easements signed up there and getting those local government units is going to be a slam dunk whatsoever. Now, now, Elliot, I'm not quite 50 years old, but, you know, I'm in my late 40s, and so I'm you liar. ancient. You're like You're older than that. twice my age. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm 48, and um, <clears throat> I might be 49. I just had a birthday. I, can't, I don't even, 74. What are you born. in dog years? The math. I, was told there'd be, <laughs> I was told there was no math on Wednesdays. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I'm kind of, when it comes to government services, I'm finding out I'm a little bit old school or outdated because what, if there's a problem with public conversation, to me, that's a little bit bizarre because there's a lot of money being invested into marketing and public relations and social media to alert the public about these issues. So when when I hear that, you know, it's 
people are just finding out now. Where's the state been on this? Because my understanding is you guys were hired because landowners were not getting a government service from the state. Is that am I following this correctly here as far as the way government services are supposed to work and where we're kind of seeing a little bit of disconnect and how you guys have got involved in this? Sure. Like, I guess I guess that my response to that would be is kind of to Steve's point. What I found is a lot of people think, you know, oh, it's not directly on my land. So, you know, oh, it's not necessarily a concern for me. Um, but there are um, concerns, you know, the broader economic development for the future of the city. Um, there's a lot of safety concerns. Um, you know, things like that. Like if this gets approved in this location, might not be on your land today, but another pipeline, if you live close, easily they could seek an easement for your land. So um, obviously the landowners and people directly impacted are at the core of this, um, you know, campaign and fight. Um, but also it's also just really important to make people um, aware and um, know about the you know concerns of this, even if there are lands not directly in the route. Um, and yeah, with the government. Oh, yeah. And we I'm had, sorry. you know. Eight, eight uh, property rights bills um, at the last legislature um, session, uh, broadly supported by, you know, a lot of landowner groups, um, groups like ours working with, you know, folks, um, family farms, things like that. But uh, unfortunately, um, the lobbyists, <laughs> it was really sad. And um, Governor Burgum's administration is kind of all in on this project. So we're up against a lot of big money um, and it, that didn't pan out how we wanted. And um, that aspect's been frustrating, but... The grassroots um, everyday people on this, I, I think, are pretty united that um, there's a lot of concerns and issues with this project. You know, one of the other things, too, is from the marketing, you know, Jason brought up the marketing side of this. You know, Summit did a very bad job because I think they thought it was a slam dunk or assurances from the governor's Ocean's office. Ocean 12, Ocean Absolutely. 12. Remember, Steve, they stole the egg. It's Ocean 12. They stole the egg already. <laughs> but... but they didn't do a marketing. I mean, first thing you do is if you're going to do a project in North Dakota, especially or anywhere, you get out in front of it. You get the marketing out there. You introduce people to the project. You sell them on the project. None of that took place. None of that diligence took place, which brings me back to any of the other diligence that I don't think took place, uh, whether oh. it was the modeling or anything else. Uh, we're up against the break. We're talking with Elliot Huggins, uh, Dakota Resource Council, concerning Summit Carbon Solutions CO2 pipeline that has been proposed. Uh, we've got uh, a little bit of uh, feedback from what took place at the Bismarck City Commission meeting this week. We'll find out about details on that next, coming up on Super Talk 1270. Follow us on Twitter. Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done us on Facebook, Super Talk 1270. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach, along with Jason Spees from The Crude Life. You can catch Crude Life Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. We're talking with Elliot Huggins, uh, Dakota Resource Council, concerning Subway Carbon Solutions proposed CO2 pipeline. And uh, kind of a big week. Uh, you had your event at the Bismarck Public Library on Monday night, Elliot, and then... Uh, uh, this week, the Bismarck City Commission uh, weighed in on their intervener status. Fill us in on that meeting. Yeah, for sure. So Bismarck, I think a couple of weeks ago at the last meeting or something ar around that time, voted to uh, officially file the petition with the Public Service Commission. And uh, a couple of days ago or yesterday, Summit actually filed their legal response to that. Um, and they didn't um, object to the city uh, participating um, as an intervener, um, as long as it was focused on the issues um, outlined in the petition. So those three things are what the city is going to be permitted, if, assuming this gets approved, is um, the Missouri River crossing, um, proximity of the pipeline to the um, city limits, and then also emergency response plans, um, emergency training. So is there an opportunity for them to not be so amicable when it comes to the Public Service Commission? Right. And so... 
the it is possible granted it's limited to those three topics that i could potentially see there being um some objections um from summit um just during the upcoming proceedings with the questions so that's something i think will be interesting to look out for um they did object to the city um first before we get to those hearings um there's going to be a hearing um on the 21st of december actually just came out t- 10 minutes ago or so um on the county ordinance um issue um, so the PSC is going to be deciding, you know, do we allow the Burley and Edmonds County ordinances to stand? And then only after that decision is made will there be the actual hearings on the application. And some had objected to Bismarck participating in that, um, arguing that, you know, Burley County and Edmonds County already have counsel. Um, it'd be kind of overly burdensome. Um, and the city uh, thought, and the city's attorney thought, okay, you know, that's actually pretty reasonable from Summit. Um, we won't participate in that hearing. So that's kind of what they decided um, the other day, and that's kind of where things stand with that. I may have a question of naivete. Sure, yeah, but it's a little complicated. When I when, when I hear the city of Bismarck wants to become an intervener, is that uh, kind of what does that mean? If I'm a citizen of Bismarck, mm-hmm. and are they are, are they picking a side here? Are they looking out for my best interest? What does that mean as a citizen of Bismarck? Yeah, and folks, if they want to read the actual petition and exactly what the city is asking for and arguing, essentially, um, you can go on the Public Service Commission website and read word for word. Uh, basically, the position the city takes is we're not um, supporting the application. Uh, We're not necessarily opposing the application, but we want to make sure we have a seat at the table to answer questions, potentially call witnesses, cross-examine some of its witnesses, um, and just make sure the city's uh, interests are protected on those those three issues. Um, And it's a pretty big deal they intervened. It's It's a pretty big deal and pretty significant, in my opinion. Yeah, and you mentioned that Summit didn't seem like they were too happy with it or made a comment something along those lines. And that kind of answered my question, but I still wanted to kind of flesh it out a little bit because there are some communities on the east side of the state, like Enderlin and Oaks, I think Lisbon, which is Oaks. Um, There's some more on the central part of of the state that have had pretty pretty public town meetings uh, against this uh, pipeline. And there was even a law that was passed I think kind of specifically questioning some of the ownership involved with this uh, uh, pipeline. So talk to me about what some of the other communities around the state are asking from and for, I guess, transparency and some other things. Yeah. So I guess like surrounding, you know, broader than let's just say the east side of the state, kind of when this all started two years ago, uh, we had six counties pass resolutions opposing eminent domain. Um, And those six counties constitute uh, the vast, vast majority of the pipeline route. And so while that's, you know, not necessarily in the purview of the Public Service Commission, I do I do think it sends a strong message that the project isn't exactly um, popular um, in these other communities. Um, Richland County surrounding the transparency issue, Richland, um, Burley and Edmonds County um, actually requested, you know, an attorney general's investigation um, into the investors of Summit. Um, and that was unfortunately denied a couple weeks ago. Um, but again, people on the east side, Richland County, you know, worked hard, um, got petitions, attended meetings, and got their city, you know, or county board to do that over there. Uh, the other really interesting county on the east side to me is uh, Dickey County. Um, been very, very, very active over there. Like you said, the Oaks area, Allendale area. And they were also a county that passed the resolution. Um, Richland was too. Um, but over there, kind of twofold. Uh, they wrote a very, very strong letter um, to the Public Service Commission um, outlining, you know, numerous uh, concerns, um, you know, asking for a transparent hearing, not a rush. Um, and that's on the PSC docket too, if anyone wants to check that out. What's really, really interesting though there is about a month or so ago, um, we had a, you know, public hearing on a county zoning ordinance there, essentially equivalent to Evans County. And what happened was the uh, Board of County Commissioners um, has been kind of really been dragging their feet on this for a while over there. And eventually at this at this meeting, um, they voted to pass the ordinance, but contingent on the state's attorney uh, signing off on it um, and sending it to the PSC. And to my knowledge, the state's attorney over there is um, refusing to do that, essentially. Um, And I know there's a lot of people over there um, not happy about that. Yeah. 
recourse right now? We're up against a break, uh, but Elliot, uh, as far as people getting engaged and getting involved, it's not too late and people need to speak up. And, and if you have concerns, know what that route looks like and get involved. Um, when we come, when we come back from the break, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, what is going on in some other states, some other communities and some other projects, uh, most notably Navigator, uh, Wolf that, uh, just shut down in Illinois and what that means to the summit project or what that could mean to North Dakota because is there an opportunity or is there a possibility that there could be more CO2 coming into North Dakota because of these other projects and the summit picking those up as well. Uh, This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bakken along with Jason Spies from The Crude Life. You can catch The Crude Life Sunday mornings 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. Also, we've got some news on uh, Public Service Commission hearing and when that's going to be taking place. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. That's Super Talk. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. The Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach, along with Jason Spies from The Crude Life. You can catch Crude Life Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. And we're talking with Elliot Huggins, the Dakota Resource Council. And uh, I want to get back to uh, what's taking place in some of the other states real quick. Uh, Summit, of course, uh, there's a possibility they could be picking up some other projects that have been shuttered. Um, most notably Navigator. Now, we just heard that Wolf... Uh, their project in Illinois shuttered as well. So there's a distinct possibility Summit could be working on picking up some of these other contracts and bringing even more CO2 into North Dakota, which means the possibility of more than one pipeline, larger pipelines, higher pressure, more potential danger. And, and we haven't even worked through what's going on right now. Right. And I told Lori Hintz earlier this week, you know, Maybe it's time to just stop for a minute and wait for FEMSA uh, because that would solve a lot of issues and a lot of questions and concerns by a lot of people. Oh, ab- absolutely. And, you know, there's so many things, I think, with this entire process that could be done differently that would um, assuage or at least um, make a lot of these concerns not as strong as they are. But unfortunately, um, the company's taken a pretty um, strong approach of kind of our way or the highway. And <laughs> that's where we find ourselves. But yeah, so uh, the Navigator, you know, CO2 pipeline project that was canceled a bl- couple weeks ago, a month or so ago. Um, and Summit, you know, immediately uh, issued a statement saying they welcome um, picking up those ethanol plants um, and adding essentially, yeah, CO2 pipelines to their network. And so I think it's around, the number always fluctuates, about 34 ethanol plants right now. And I want to say there was 20-something on that pipeline. So, yeah, I mean, Summit easily, we could go to 50 ethanol plants, which is going to mean more pipelines, bigger pipelines. More pressures. Uh, more, more pressures. More safety protocols that need to be addressed. Because that's one of the things, come back to the counties and the cities, is you know, the safety side. It's like public safety. You need to know what you're dealing with. And that's kind of a vaguity right now. But you need to know what you're dealing with so you can have the things in place to protect the public if something happens. Well, exactly. And what I find, I guess, frustrating as a resident of the city of Bismarck is Summit um, actually met with emergency response officials and county officials um, on Monday um, to share some information. Um, That was obviously a pretty private meeting. And what what strikes me is, you know, this is months after the permit's been denied, years after the project's been announced. And this meeting is is just now taking place. So that, that, I guess, rubs me the wrong way a little bit. And there's a lot of questions and a lot of un, and there, there have been unanswered to date. And that's why I think, you know, people remain concerned about this. I understand there's a public service announcement for a, a date coming up on, on, on something. I'm not sure what it is. I just saw the headline. Is there um, anything that people need to be aware about with this public service commission date and also if they add these new uh, navigator 
orphan wells or orphan uh, ethanol plant <laughs> right. to the system. <laughs> right. would, would, would they have to go through the Public Service Commission or can they just may, add it because they already have the pipe? Well, they would they would obviously have to go through whatever state processes, you know, they're the equivalent of the Public Service Commission. But again, like the whole point of this project in theory is to benefit the ethanol industry. And okay, let's let's just take that at face value. Again, we only have one of the 34 plants in North Dakota benefiting. One of 34. And then we want to make that one of 50. And you know, we are taking the risk um Bismarck Burley, Emmons County with the 24-inch pipeline, we're taking the risk with the sequestration. And the purported benefits of the project, which is, again, you know, these ethanol low-carbon markets, uh, North Dakota, the state of North Dakota isn't the ones benefiting from that. So, I mean, to me, <laughs> I, they want us to be a public service commission in, you know, proceeding because those ethanol plants aren't located here. Um, but it would just be, yeah, more risk um, for her, even arguably less reward. We're talking with Elliot Huggins, uh, Dakota Resource Council. Elliot, uh, I know you guys are following this closely. Uh, we talk with uh, uh, Lori Hintz over at Beck News. You can go to Beck.News. For more information, where do people reach out? Uh, how do they get a hold of the Dakota Resource Council? Um, because like we said, um, the new routing, a lot of people may not know about that yet. So how do people get more information? Yeah, um, folks are welcome to um, send me an email anytime. Um, Elliot, E-L-I-O-T, at drcinfo.com. I'm always happy to hear from new folks. Um, I'm even <laughs> uh, available, happy to take phone calls, uh, 701-997-5181. And again, this you know takes everybody, takes active engagement, and absolutely there's still ways to get involved. This isn't going to be resolved uh, for quite some time. And uh, breaking news as well, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy is uh, going to be in Iowa uh, because carbon sequestration is now going to be on the platform, on the stage, and a point for the presidential campaign. He's going to be down in Iowa this Friday, Public Service Commission uh, Friday at 2 o'clock, uh, their meeting. So uh, a lot going on this week with Summit Carbon Solutions proposed CO2 pipeline. Elliot, thanks for coming in. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, Jason Spees with the Dakota, uh, Elliot with the Dakota Resource Council, Jason Spees with Crude Life. Uh, when we come back, Matt Fern on Super Talk 1270.
KXXX AM, Mandan Bismarck, a Town Square media station, broadcasting from the View Community Credit Union Studio. Conservative talk without apology. The Regular Joe Show with Joe Giganti. Weekday evenings at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app. Portions of the following program are pre recorded. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270. This is Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Eichel. I'm with Jason Spees from True Life and True Life. Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. And uh, a little press conference took place yesterday uh, concerning the Commerce Department and some film opportunities. Joining us in the program, Matt Fern. Uh, Matt, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you for having me, guys. Um, so, Matt, I uh, I want to back up a little bit because there's a little bit of a longer story to this. Now, Jason and I talk all the time about um, commerce being the de facto slush fund uh, for the the governor's office. And, and whether this is part of that or not uh, it, it is relevant at the moment. But there's some concerns with some of the spending from a transparency perspective with commerce and a film or multiple film projects here in North Dakota. Uh, we've got a lot of great uh, filmmakers, a lot of people that do some some great artwork. Um, and, and, but now we've got the government through commerce playing what appears to be favorites. And to me, that brings up a bunch of ethics issues, transparency issues. Um, let's stop for a minute, back up. Matt, tell us where this started, because uh, it, it's about one film company here in North Dakota, a uh, canical production that does some great work. Um, but now it seems we have commerce spending taxpayer dollars for the benefit of one, not all, filmmakers. Yeah, well, I first uh, became aware of the 2021 and 2022 motion picture production and recruitment grants um, this July when the Department of Commerce announced they had awarded uh, the Bismarck Base Canical Productions $600,000 um, to help produce two feature films uh, made in North Dakota. And um, I was pretty surprised that uh, that opportunity um, was there because that is the largest, as far as I can tell, the largest grant for filmmakers in the state of North Dakota. And when I looked into it a little bit, I saw um, that there was only six business days allowed for production companies to apply for it. It was announced late on a Friday and then um, about a week later on a Monday, applications were, were done. And so um, I did a, um, a request for more information for the commerce. And I had found out um, that uh, not only was $600,000 just awarded to Candle Productions, they also were awarded $100,000 two years ago to make the film End of the Rope. And that was pretty surprising because there was never a press release about it, never an announcement about it. Even the website for the Department of Commerce Transparency, where they list all grant um, recipients, is uh, says report coming soon, even though it was two years ago. Um, so I was surprised that not only did this company receive $600,000, it was actually $700,000 um, with only six business days for people to not only apply, but to find about it, learn about it prepare an application and submit an application were six business days. And um, also with that open records request, um, we were given um, what Canical Productions submitted as an application for that $600,000 this year. And it is shocking. It is a page and a half um, of, of no script, no budget, uh, no cast, no release strategy. All the stuff that is very fundamental and basic for video grants um, was absent. It basically was, I want to make uh, two feature films in North Dakota. It's going to be $600,000. And um, I mean, surprisingly, there is a big section in there where Canical requests payment through their nonprofit company, um, which is a totally different... Oh. Let's pause there now. Uh, this is a nonprofit as, as well, Canical? 
I, I don't know how Canonical works. I'm just referencing uh, their application. They did reference if they were given the grant money, which they were given, um, that payment be made. I will quote their, their own application here. If awarded the grant, we would request that payment be made to Canonical Productions through our nonprofit arm, Grain of Wheat Productions. And when I searched Grain of Wheat Production with the North Dakota Secretary of State website, um, it shares the same residential address as Canonical Productions, and it also wasn't even registered with the state as a nonprofit um, until after this so application. Th that's what's interesting to me about this is that um, I'm I'm a little bit familiar with Canonical because of the the end of the rope, the 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 um, the lynching movie, the last lynching in North Dakota, which received a hundred thousand dollars. Without any, so that's what's interesting about it. This is okay. So this is what's interesting to me about it is that I have been trying to educate Senator Kramer, specifically Senator Kevin Kramer, Senator John Hoven, and Governor Doug Burgum publicly at press conferences about the thought worker and how that is an emerging issue in the United States because eighty percent of thought workers now consist of the marketplace. This is a thought worker type of a deal here. This is where they, they literally can pick winners and losers and not have to worry about who built a better mousetrap because they can just, it's subjective when you're talking about thought workers, okay? So that, that filming was going on while I was doing some stuff out in the Bakken. So what happens when you're a thought worker your money goes to salaries. It goes to staying in hotels. And that's where I met them is that they were staying in the little Missouri River Inn out there, which is a very nice hotel. And so that's interesting because to me, it would seem that that $100,000 was just redirected to the hospitality industry in Watford City. And that's another subsidy that went out to the oil patch. That's how I look at that. But that's from my perspective, Matt, because I have a little bit of uh, uh, context with this. Where the $600,000 is going, I have absolutely no idea. But I'd like to know what, these, what they're paying themselves in salaries. Because when you're talking about a company that doesn't manufacture something, that you don't have to buy raw materials, that makes this money extremely valuable extremely valuable. So talk to me a little bit about how this upsets the marketplace. How is, is this something that, you know, makes you react as an individual? I mean, you had a press conference, so it must impact your business. Yeah, I think this is an incredible opportunity. I think these grants are coming from a great place. Um, I think North Dakota does need more exposure nationally. I think um, North Dakota should be more competitive in motion picture production. Just last week, Fargo premiered season five. That's a nationally, you know, globally recognized show, has a bunch of awards, and it's shot up in Canada because there's no infrastructure in North Dakota and there's no um, production incentives, tax incentives. Now, traditionally, up in Canada, or most tax incentives, it's a dollar in, dollar out. You give money to the state, the state will reimburse you. That way, it kind of expands budgets. So that's the reason why Fargo is filming up there and other productions. And I believe that was the intent of these grants, to make North Dakota more competitive um, and to try to get more exposure. Do you know Nate Anderson from Minot, Matt? I don't. N N Nathan Anderson, he a film company a number of years ago and commerce straight out told him they are not in the filmmaking business and they cited woolly boys because of that that bomb you know when when Promersberger and his group tried to do a movie called woolly boys and so there's been people who have actually tried not only to do movies with commerce but on the oil and gas industry and they were not only denied but again steve and i have talked about this before they go too far. They go too far. They say things that are just borderline discriminatory. And it just, it, it really leaves a sour taste in your mouth. At least that's my experience dealing with it and other people's experience. Um, what is your 
experience on that. Steve, I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to usurp your deal there. I just remembered uh, Nate Anderson. I know we have to hit a break. So, Steve, sorry. <laughs> Tell you what, uh, why don't we take the break? We'll come back and we'll visit with Matt about that after the break. Uh, this is Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bach along with Jason Spees from The Crude Life. You can catch Crude Life Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. We're talking to Matt Fern, uh, North Dakota filmmaker. Uh, does a lot of great work around uh, the Bismarck Mandan community. A lot of great work across the state, regionally and nationally as well. And uh, we're talking about commerce and uh, basically government with your tax dollars picking winners and losers. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Uh, Super Talk. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Talk of the town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Michael along with Jason Speech from Food Life. We're talking to Matt Firm, a North Dakota filmmaker, and uh, we're talking about uh, commerce and the state picking winners and losers when it comes to the filmmaking industry here in North Dakota. Um, basically writing up an RFP, it appears, that uh, was designed around one filmmaking company here in North Dakota, one that was local, and uh, not having an RFP that was out for all filmmakers in North Dakota, uh, but uh, already had picked where that money was going by uh, the looks of the RFP, um, <laughs> page, page and a half. Uh, of requirements uh, and specifically detailed to what that company wanted to do with the money. Uh, we're talking with Matt Fern. Uh, Jason, uh, you had a question going into the break. I'll ask you to rephrase that for Matt. Yeah, so I guess I'll give a little history and context here is that uh, from my memory when we interviewed Nate Anderson uh, from Minot who was trying to do a movie uh, actually showcasing the oil and gas industry because he was working for uh, oil and gas companies out in uh, Tioga, Stanley, Minot area. And his background was filmmaking. And so he did, he went into the, you know, went out and got no jobs in the oil patch basically to do some method acting and method producing and, and, and directing also to raise money to do this at the uh, film project too. Well, the state of North Dakota had given some money to um, a couple of uh, very prominent and wealthy businessmen in the Fargo-Moorhead community to go do a movie called Wooly Boys. And it bombed considerably, just bombed. And so that was their justification for not really uh, listening to Nate Anderson, just dismissing him and his energy and his enthusiasm. And, you know, he was he moved back here from... He left, he left North Dakota and moved back to try to find opportunity and found none. And he just ran into brick wall after brick wall from, from commerce and, and, and the government. I've had, ever, ever since COVID uh, and a little bit pre-COVID, um, it has been borderline hate speech and Department of Discrimination from uh, the state of North Dakota towards me. This is all the way it is. How has your relationship been? How is your, because uh, it didn't start out that way. I just finally said enough is enough after 10 years. How has it been for you? Because you're not Nate Anderson. You're not Jason Spies. You're not somebody else. You, you're somebody who's been very active in the state of North Dakota. You have a history in this industry. How did the state treat you? How was your response uh, received, I guess. I'm just kind of looking as a, as a behavioral and an overall theme here because I believe you mentioned it either on the air or in the pre-interview that you are going to be seeking out some ethics violations through this whole thing. So talk to me a little bit about what's happening. Yeah. Um, in terms of my relationship uh, or my interaction with the Department of Commerce, it has always been positive. Um, throughout the years, um, I've reached out with them uh, with questions about film industry. Um, they also, I also worked with them to create a website for um, Tourism's website 
um, to um, connect filmmakers. Making movies is really hard. And so I worked with them to create a database of all different companies, actors, resources, um, locations. I wrote together some articles about drone laws and everything just as a resource. Um, and Commerce has been really great to work with on that. They were um, happy to connect and build the film industry here. Um, and so that's why I was so shocked when I saw that um, this $600,000 was awarded. And so um, I had a good relationship with them. I emailed them right away and said, is this is this real? Am I reading this right? You guys only gave six business days to give out $600,000 and didn't require really any vetting or um, any information um, to determine who got that. Um, and they said, I mean, pretty much, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it worked. Um, so I do appreciate that they have been responsive to all of my questions. I've had a good relationship with them. Um, so I have, I have no animosity towards them, but, um, I just would like someone to give me some answers of who thought this was a good idea, who thought this was the best use of North Dakota taxpayer money, um, to give $700,000 to one company to make these films. Um, and I know this $600,000, it's not going to end well because they already had a chance two years ago. They were given $100,000 and they didn't say anything. Um, so I'm not very confident that they're going to turn it around this time. Making a movie is hard, let alone making two movies. Um, and they have to spend this fund, they have to spend this within, a, I believe it's about a year and a half left within the biennium. The funds have to be spent. Um, so uh, nothing against commerce, but I need some answers here. And and it's not just me, it's myself and 26 other film producers from across the state representing 17 different companies. None of us have gotten answers. None of us had a chance um, to even know about this. Why don't we take the break? We'll come back and we'll visit with Matt about that after the break. Uh, this is Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bach along with Jason Spees from The Crude Life. You can catch Crude Life Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. We're talking to Matt Fern, uh, North Dakota filmmaker. Uh, does a lot of great work around uh, the Bismarck Mandan community. A lot of great work across the state, regionally and nationally as well. And uh, we're talking about commerce and uh, uh, basically, government with your tax dollars picking winners and losers. Uh, this is Talk of the Town at Super Talk 1270. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile, and the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time, there's Granger, offering professional grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bachelor with Jason Spies from Crude Life. You can get Crude Life Sunday mornings, 10 a.m., right here on Super Talk 1270. Uh, looking uh, forward to the week in review uh, coming up this Sunday. Always some entertaining uh, information concerning not only North Dakota and the Bakken and the oil path, but uh, what's going on in some of the other shale plays as well and how that national energy picture plays out uh, right here in North Dakota. Uh, we're talking with Matt Fern, a uh, local filmmaker here in the Bismarck Mandan area. Uh, Oh, well, Matt, that, that was my question, uh, you know, in your conversations. And, of course, the press conference yesterday uh, um, kind of reiterated some of this. Um, you know, what's the, the the taste in the mouth of filmmakers? We, I mean, very quietly and I think too quietly, we've got a, a pretty good video business here in North Dakota. Uh, a lot of really good filmmakers do great work. Um, in your conversations, uh, reiterate a little bit of, of – I don't know, is a sense of disbelief about uh, how commerce had, had doled out this money. And, and then I want to ask you about the process leading up to this, because it, through the legislature, there's got to be a, a committee that this goes through for projects like this. So walk us through both of those. Yeah, in terms of the process of how this is awarded, I did an open records request, and it turned out there was three people within the Department of Commerce who um, determined who was awarded this most recent $600,000. In total, there were four applications. Um, only one of them, the one Canical, was for two films. The other three weren't even for movies. They were for TV show pilots. Um, so I think that's a big question of what is this for? Is it movies? Is it not movies? Um, 
because if it's only movies, there is absolutely no competition. There is only one possible uh, application. Um, so only three people were the ones that determined it um, within the Department of Commerce. Two of those three people we found in special thanks uh, in the credits as special thanks for past Canical productions. Um, so I wonder if there's any conflict of interest there. Um, but uh, yeah, and then um, in terms of uh, just what we how we've gotten here, um, this all came out in July that this was awarded. And so on August 30th, myself and 25 or 24 at the time, um, filmmakers submitted an open letter to Governor Burgum asking for answers. Um, and we haven't heard anything. It's been three months, no reply to the 25 filmmakers from 17 companies asking the governor for answers. And the only response we heard was through the Bismarck Tribune when they contacted the governor's office in September um, to ask him about this. And they declined if they would even look into this. Um, and so that's why we got here today. It's been three months with not a single response from the governor's office. The only thing we heard was they're not even considering looking into it. And so that's why yesterday we had the press conference um, where we submitted a second letter to the Office of Attorney General, the Office of State Auditor, and the Office of State Procurement, I'm trying to hope someone takes some accountability and looks at this. Um, and we also are looking at um, filing an ethics complaint through the North Dakota Ethics Commission, um, specifically towards Daniel Belinsky, the founder and the person who applied for all these grants, the founder of Canical Productions and the person that applied for these grants. Um, uh, and our complaint against him is that he was hosting screenings um, with certain members of the legislature. And so uh, we're currently looking into that and our options for that. But we're just hoping this is not how North Dakota does business. And we're just waiting for someone to step up and give us some answers. And even if if they think this is how it should be done, um, we'd like some clarity and transparency. So if for some way we, we filmmakers have another opportunity when, when funding comes up here um, in a year and a half, um, that more than just one, one person who doesn't even run the company full time, he's a, he's a teacher at a university in Bismarck, um, hopefully more than just one person has an opportunity. Hey, Steve, I know we got to run to a break. I did want to ask um, before we, or you know what, when we come back from the break, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you about the, the Daniel Belinsky because I did a quick Google search and his there's he's got like four or five different LLCs that Teddy the Series, Sanctuary the Series, uh, something called Hazy Films. I mean, well, that's, for one, just, like, I don't the, know how it works out, but it, it is pretty typical when a film is created. Yeah, they're all the LLC different film projects. For the film. So the okay, film so is each, its own each business. one becomes its own business. Okay, that's <laughs> so that's perfectly fine. He has done fine. a couple of films, so it does sound legit to me. But I, I haven't looked. The, the part that does concern me, though, is that he's with the University of Mary because when we did an open records request, we found that Commerce, uh, the Petroleum Council, and Mary was working behind the scenes on projects before they were available to the public through open records requests and nobody did any investigating on that e even we we uh in fact we we gave it to josh boshi speaker of the house and he didn't even do any investigation that's how much power they have there so i want to ask you about the university of mary when we come back steve all right we're up against a break uh, this is talk of the town on a wattage wednesday i'm steve Ike, along with jason speeds following some breaking news uh press conference yesterday concerning uh uh, the doling out of taxpayer dollars for a, a couple film projects that uh, apparently, by by all indications, looks as if the the grants were written before the RFP was crafted to meet the criteria of a special or particular business that was applying for those grants. Uh, more when we come back, we're talking with Matt Fern, also Jason Spees from The Crude Life. You can catch a Crude Life Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. Uh, we're talking about a press conference that took place yesterday concerning uh, a grant the Commerce Department had doled out for a particular business. And it seems by all indications that the grant RFP was written to the specs of that company for some projects that were already in the queue. So 
um, hey, we're finding a way to spend taxpayer dollars any way we can uh, through commerce. So, Jason, you had a question going into the break. Yeah, I just, like I said, I saw that the gentleman who got the, the Grant Daniel Belinsky, or I believe, I believe that's how you pronounce it. He worked at University of Mary. And, you know, for me, I'm a Catholic. I was an altar boy. I was a Sunday school teacher for eight years. I went to a Catholic school. So I do pay attention to a little bit of the Catholic school, uh, diocese, et cetera. So we did an open records request. Like I said, there was, it was clear that the Petroleum Council, the University of Mary and Commerce had worked a deal out before anything went public. And so I was very disappointed to see Mary's involvement in this. And I know it's a hot topic because they have a lot of money invested in the community in a lot of different areas. So people are very afraid to speak out against it. But, you know, I mean, ethics are ethics. Values are values. And if I could Um, talk to me about, about this, Matt, a little bit. Well, regarding University of Mary, full disclosure, uh, they are a client of mine, but I have not seen any evidence that they are um, involved in these in canical productions in any way or in these film grants in any way. Um, I have not seen any evidence of that at all. Um, It seems very separate um, from his work at at that university, these film grants. so, yeah, just to clarify here, I have yeah. in no way saying University of Mary is involved in either of the distribution of the motion picture production and recruitment grants through the Department of Commerce. So that, it would just be a uh, coincidence on my my part than looking at it. Um, the other question I had is, are you familiar with what's happening in South Dakota with Freedom Works and the governor there and, and some of their issues with this same problem? I'm not. I'm not. Uh, check it out, Freedom Works, and uh, they also had a, a very large advertising campaign contract given to someone that, you know, basically turned in what the what the the, the one page sheeter like you said type of a thing, and so they kind of had. This. Anyway, my point is this is blowing up a little bit into other states as well. So, uh, Steve, I know that we're pushed for time, so uh, I'll hand it back to you for some questions too. Uh, Matt, uh, just before we let you go here, I I did want to come back a little bit to the legislature and the committees, because the way the process works, of course, it goes through committees, um, uh, you know, without pointing fingers, uh, because we don't know right now. But when there's a project where there's taxpayer dollars, that has to go through the legislature. Um, So there had to be a committee somewhere uh, that this money was funneled through that gave the thumbs up, thumbs down before that moved on through the Commerce Department. Um, Those committees take place a while ago. So, you know, I I, kind of walk me through the timeline of this a little bit because I'm trying to think it's like, okay, how far back did Canonical Productions be identified as, hey, we're going to give them some money? Because that when you look at the RFP and, and everything on the surface, and I know there's still some investigation that needs to be done with this, but on the surface, that's what it looks like. So going back to the committees and, and doling out the money and assigning uh, money to projects uh, so that commerce can, can spend that taxpayer dollars, um, yeah. any indications of how long ago this was in the queue? Um, well, it was a line item in this biennium's budget, the, the 2023 Motion Picture Production and Recruitment Grant. Um, and so the funds have, became available um, sometime in June or July. Um, and then I don't have the dates in front of me, um, but then pretty soon after the funds were available, um, it was a line item in the budget of uh, the state of North Dakota. Um, that's when Commerce announced um, the 10 day, but really it was six business day window um, to apply for the full amount of $600,000 that then had to be expended um, uh, before the end of the biennium. Um, so um, yeah, as soon as it was approved and a line item in the budget um, this summer, they they um, announced it and it's been six six days it was open and then it was closed six business days to clarify, and then it was closed. And then they made the announcement um, that the money was um, awarded to Canical Productions. 
Um, you know, Matt, as far you, as you I know, a little earlier about uh, you know that's you know you didn't think that's the way we did business in North Dakota, and it used to not be the way that we did business in North Dakota. But unfortunately, under our current governor and, and tapping to the legacy fund and and spending taxpayer dollars, it, it's becoming the norm. It, it's becoming yeah, it is the way we do business in North Dakota. Uh, spending taxpayer dollars in in you know reckless fashion not good investments into state uh state infrastructure i you know there's better ways to get returns i <laughs> a lot going on here matt uh thanks very much for joining us uh, today uh, uh appreciate you raising this concern and and pointing out another issue and and uh you know as far as next steps for the for the filmmakers and and Y'all from the uh, the press conference yesterday, is it going to be uh, an inquiry to the Ethics Commission? Uh, what are your next steps? Um, I mean, we're we're waiting to hear from the governor still. We're waiting to hear from um, the offices that we uh, addressed yesterday. Um, and we'd like to just at least hear that someone's looking into this um, or someone can provide some transparency. Um, and then we'll we'll take it from there. I mean... I don't want to be doing this. None of the other 26 other filmmakers want to be doing this. We're all busy. I got two other shoots here today. Um, so I'd love for the someone to be an adult within the state of North Dakota government and uh, say, hey, this is not appropriate. Let's resolve it. Um, but until someone steps up, uh, I know myself and, and the, the 26 other filmmakers, we're going to be making noise uh, until someone at least gives us some sort of answer. Well, if you need some help making noise, uh, you know where to come, Matt. So uh, appreciate your candor this afternoon. Uh, or appreciate your candor this morning. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. 1270. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach along with Joe Sheehan from Benchmark Mortgage, your mortgage planner. Give him a call at 701 400 3926. Also, Randy joining us. Uh, interesting in the home market uh, side of things. And, and you know what? If you have a plan, if you've got a mortgage plan in place, now's not a time to, to start thinking about buying a house. It, it, it's not a bad time right now. Um, people get hung up on the interest rates. And uh, we've learned that there's so much more to just interest rates. Well, and so, you know, we have a real simple message on this show. If you need a mortgage planner, call me. Um, but but Randy but Randy is here today. Seven zero one four hundred three nine two six. Randy, yeah. Randy's a little more open minded than I am. Yeah. Uh, so Randy, Randy, why don't you tell people maybe uh, let's one of the things that you're really good at is like how do you how do you pick a, your mortgage plan or what are the advice you give to people and who you're looking for and how you know you're working with the right person. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's, uh, I haven't been on the radio for a while, so it's nice to come and spend some time with you guys. Um, First thing that comes to my mind when it comes to picking a lender, there's so many different ones out there. Um, and I think it can be a little tricky to know who has what for experience. Um, but one thing that not a lot of people know is you can look up, you can look up a lender's NMLS license online. There's a, there's a site that you can look them up and you can see just, Which just, for just national mortgage license, license service. Yeah, right. Right. But that'll help you if you're, if, if you're curious to just how many years or where somebody's career path has been at you can you can you can find it easily online if 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 that's something well and most people don't think about that side of the diligence i mean you have to have your due diligence right now whether you're looking at a house if you're working with a realtor if you're looking for a lender because most people will just they'll ask the realtor hey who should i go with or mm -hmm. they'll go hey i bank at uh x y and z so that's where you go mm -hmm. and and that's not always the best solution. It could be a solution, but it's not always the best solution. Well, like Randy's MLS history will show, if, Randy's MLS history will show a 15 plus year career um, versus, you know, you go sign up on Rocket and look for the NMLS person you're talking to and it's yesterday. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you might be surprised. You might be surprised at, at what somebody has or doesn't have for experience. And um, there's a lot more to mortgages than just interest rates. And well, experience them. matters. Yeah. And, and, and Joe and I talk all the time about uh, uh, the nuances with the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency and the different programs that are out there, which it's important to know those right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there can be a lot to putting a mortgage together correctly. And it, it comes with experience. You know, it, t- it does take time to... Well, knowing the options is what that experience gives you. Because yep. a lot of people, oh, well, here, here's the cookie cutter mortgage plan that, uh, do you fit this box? It, no. <laughs> right. I, I, I might have something a little creative. There might be a better plan out there. What are the other options? That's experience. That, right. Y- you need that experience to go, okay, there's a USDA, there's an FDA, there's, there's different plans out there for different people in different scenarios. Yeah. And one thing I would say uh, back to what you were uh, referring to as far as just uh, who you're choosing and, and maybe you're getting direction to, to go one with one particular lender is I wouldn't make a decision too much in your mind without actually going and meeting with them. So even if somebody were to give you a name to start with, um, that that's great. That, that's pointing you in a direction. But uh, sometimes I'll get people that will ask me uh, my opinion, and then one of the questions I'll ask them is, is have you sat down and met with them? Have you had a chance to, to, uh, to get some of these questions out there? And, and they'll say, no, I haven't yet. And I'll say, well, do that first, because you're, you're, you're making a lot of uh, decisions that you're, you're, you might be making too early without meeting with them first. See, and this is, this is why you know, Randy's such a great member of the team. He's the gentler, kinder, kinder soul on the team <laughs> and he's he so nice. on radio but he's, he's better looking too so. I, yeah. ask you know, <laughs> ask hey hey ask them like are you gonna ever meet them you know then you got me on the way hey let me tell you the truth folks most lenders don't attend your closing anymore like that's that's a great question randy because what most people don't understand is that they're going to be given a pre-approval letter and then they're going to be abandoned on the side of the road mm-hmm. That's almost what's happening to almost every customer out there right now. And and that's the difference between, you know, benchmark people and, and other people. Well, and what happens a lot, too, is, you, you, okay, you'll show up and then the title guy will be there and or person and then, and then that's it. Um, okay, wait a minute. Uh, your realtor will be there. But um, how many times does somebody walk into, oh, well, you got to come up with another $3,000 of closing or $3,500 of closing because the numbers are well, – Okay, first of all, that's a bad position to put somebody in to when they're buying a house. And, and then you could lose a deal over $3,500. Mm-hmm. So it, it, no surprises. Mm-hmm. And when the lender's there, you don't get the surprises. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, you know, that's a good question. You could come right out and ask up front uh, is to your lender is if, they'll, if, if, you, if they'll give you the word that they'll be there at closing. And and that's that's a good question. That's a really good question to ask. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of times it's hard for a customer to to under to know when talking with somebody uh, if you know they sound like they're they're great and they might have a lot of information right up front, but to what degree will they be there for you in the last two weeks of the process? And really, that's when it's a lot of times. KLXX AM, Mandan Bismarck, a Town Square Media Station, broadcasting from the View Community Credit Union Studio. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, For the ones who get it done.